I'm just going to talk to you briefly about um, emergency preparedness for the ICU. And um, please be interactive. Don't let me do all the talking. Please ask questions and share because uh, it's not a topic that uh, anybody has a tremendous amount of experience with. It's one of those things that comes along. But um, So let's we'll talk about a few of the characteristics of likely disasters, what our responsibilities are, particularly in the ICU, and what can we do to better prepare for an emergency. One of the important concepts to understand is the idea of um, supply and demand uh, with medical surge and uh, and so we have to understand that uh, there is a certain amount of surge capacity that we can develop um, and we can do that with a, a, um, a certain uh, to a certain degree um, but uh, to go beyond that to gener generate that surge capacity basically means we have to um, uh, plan for it and prepare for it and it's kind of it's not really compatible with the efficient model of healthcare that we currently provide you know the current model that's used in healthcare is to provide just enough services to meet demand to have what's called just-in-time supply delivery so that every morning you know uh, a big black truck drives up here at you know six o'clock or six ten after the morning that's the next day a day and a half certain worth of supplies and that's it. The hospital doesn't really keep a big cache of equipment. There's no big warehouse full of supplies to be used for the next month. What's going to be used this week is going to be delivered this week. So you might remember this. This is about a month ago. This is San Diego without any lights. Um, just a little reminder what can happen, okay? Now, this was an interesting event because, I mean, it didn't technically meet the, the, the definition of disaster, but if you think about it, you know, Nothing actually was wrong with the electrical system. It just wasn't working. There wasn't an earthquake, you know, there wasn't a bunch of stuff that was broken. There wasn't, uh, you know, a bunch of pylons that were down in the desert that would take weeks to rebuild. All the system was there, all the power plants were there. All that happened was there was a temporary imbalance and the whole thing came down like a house of cards. Now, imagine if there had been an earthquake or a fire, and we had lost all the lost power lines that would take you know days to weeks to rebuild. What would happen? How long would it take to get that grid to come back up? So I mean, it definitely shows we definitely have some vulnerabilities, and as technology becomes more sophisticated, these things are very much more likely to happen. So they blamed it on some worker near Yuma, but obviously you know if you create a system where one guy can push a button and all the lights go off in two states, that's. <laughs> That's not Bubba's, that, Bubba didn't do that. You know? Okay, so it's warm out there today. The uh, Santa Ana's are blowing a little bit, and you may remember this. Anybody remember uh, when this was done? How quickly we forget, how quickly we forget. Right, so this was 2003, and what that is, is that's California, and that's smoke, and you can see how the Santa Ana's are blowing out of the desert into the populated area of California and the smoke is just pouring out of, the, out of, the, out of those, uh, that brush around the cities. And you can actually see, you know, where um, LA and San Diego are. San Diego is completely, uh, completely covered in smoke, but so is most of LA. And, um, and of course, this was San Diego, Rancho Bernardo. And that's a, you know, you can see there's a few vehicles in there along the road. That was a fire line to defend that particular town, part of the town. Of course, happened all over again four years later, and now it's 2011, it's four years after that, so, right? Now, this year we've had a lot of rain, and we've only had a couple of weeks of Santa Ana's, but, you know, in 2007, we had three or four Santa Ana's like this, short ones, and then we had a big one that lasted about a week. At the end of that week, stuff started burning, so it can happen any time. Um, and then, of course, there's other kinds of, ter of uh, disasters, and that's man-made. This is a sub Madrid subway bombing, and uh, this was a very uh, nasty attack, very simply performed. They just took knapsacks with bombs, put them on all the subway cars throughout Madrid during morning rush hour, and they created a huge number of casualties. One hospital received 312 patients over two and a half hours. Can you imagine us receiving 312 bombing victims in two and a half hours? You know, that's the sort of thing that can happen. And, of course, it happened all over again in the next year in, in uh, London. Of course, next year London's having the Olympics. You can imagine what things are like there in the trauma system and the ICU system. They're obviously a little bit worried. Anybody know what this is? That was a tsunami. 
most people in that picture are dead. They have no idea what they're even looking at there, but they don't realize that's imminent death. Is San Diego a tsunami uh, vulnerable city? You betcha. Yeah, it definitely is. We're facing, most of the coast here faces a little bit south and southwest, so we have a little bit of protection from Japan and the North Pacific, but we still are open to uh, tsunamis from the south, particularly from uh, Chile. So that was 2004 as well. And of course, remember this, this was 2005, that was Katrina. You know, this is University Hospital, New Orleans, 2005. You can see the emergency department there, the water is about halfway up the doors. The whole bottom floor was flooded, the hospital was useless. Guess where the uh, emergency generators were? Uh, basement. Yeah. You know, this has got to be bad planning. You know, New Orleans, that part of New Orleans is basically below sea level with a, a levee, right? So they got to know it's a bad idea. But anyway, that hospital never reopened, really. Saren and Tokyo subway, that was back in 95, but that's definitely something that can happen. It's a big worry. You know, interestingly, this attack, although it made about 5,000 people scared or sick, it only killed about seven people. But it was uh, particularly nasty and effective. It took a long time for the Japanese, almost four hours, to realize what they were dealing with. This is, of course, Oklahoma City, Murrah Federal Building, in domestic terrorism, as they call it. And of course, there's a precedent for this. This is a picture from Beirut, okay? And um, this was the bombing of the American Marine Barracks in, in Beirut. This was the view, uh, actually, from about uh, two and a half miles away. And you, you see what looks like a mushroom cloud. It was actually, that was one of the largest man-made suicide bombs until that point, you know? Geez, nobody even thought of a suicide bomb back in this time, right? That was 19. That was 1983. That's basically the, what was left of the. That's just an overview. That's a hole that was left in, the, in front of the building. So, uh, if you get a scale there, this is a car. That's how big the hole was. Geez, nobody would ever, nobody ever try to blow up a building like that again, right? Well, geez, they did it. They did it in Federal Murrah, and of course there was 9/11, which was the same idea. You know, it keeps on happening. So. And there are things to warn us. You know, this is a friend of mine. He was my next door neighbor, and I used to live in Pasadena. And um, he's a guy at USC who's responsible for uh, earthquake uh, department. And he points out little facts like uh, uh, we are way overdue for a big one, um, and that uh, LA and, and uh, San Diego, but particularly LA, um, hasn't had a major earthquake. Um, in terms of thousands of years for quite some time that were really quite due. The last really massive earthquake um, in LA was, um, was quite a while ago and, and what's happening is there's a lot of earthquakes in unpopulated areas in the desert. But he said eventually that's going to stop and the main fault, which is the San Andreas, is going to start moving again, you know. So California has a 99.7% chance of a M magnitude 6.7, which is a major, major earthquake in the next 30 years. So anybody who plan here plans living more than 30 years and living in California, you will be here when this happens. The only question is, which fault will it be, okay? If it happens to be fault two, four, or six, you're okay. But they're thinking that's probably the most likely place, but it could go anywhere down that fault with salt and sea, and there we are. The other problem too is even if it doesn't hit San Diego, if it knocks at all the highways and you know, aqueducts and whatnot, Los Angeles, we're going to be trapped here because all our outflow, all our, our interstates will be taken out. And we're going to be locked in a room with a crazy person called Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, you know, what's going to happen in Los Angeles when the lights don't go on, the ventilators don't work, and the hospitals are all dark without water? They're all going to start coming our way, right? So, even though you say, oh, it'll never happen in San Diego, the nearest big fault to us is, you know, is over, over in a salt sea, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, it's true. And there are other faults. I mean, there's, a, there's an earthquake fault just uh, half a mile this way called the Rose Canyon Fault, which um, is one of the reasons why Hillcrest is high and Interstate 5 is low. Another, there's a lot of other misconceptions too. You know, the first misconception I have to disabuse of is that it won't happen. It's going to happen sooner or later, sometime in your career, it's going to happen. And it's not going to be the day before your retirement, probably. It's more likely to be before then, so, right? There's another misconception. There's a lot of government around. The government's going to come and help us. Well, that's not true. What does the government actually tell us? They say, 
you are responsible for yourself for up to 96 hours. We will not be able to help you before 96 hours. So you have basically, they used to say 72. Now they say 96. Basically, you're on your own cup. You'll figure it out for yourself. That's basically the message we've gotten from the state and the feds. So that's why you see us with so much disaster equipment and drills and whatnot, is that we have no expectation anyone's going to come to help us because that's been the record. By the time the volunteers from outside, the outside uh, federal assistance, the outside state assistance shows up, it's too late. And so there's this gap in response of 96 hours from the state and the feds before they show up in our town. So we have to deal with that. And there are fantastic resources out there. The state has two of these things. These are inflatable hospitals uh, that the uh, state EMS authority has control over. Uh, one's in Northern California, one's in Southern California. It's got everything in there. The only problem is if you look carefully at the equipment in here, it's actually military grade equipment. They, they use folding beds, they use military ventilators, military IV pumps, stuff you've never seen before unless you've been in the reserves, you know, so, or have been in active duty. So you've never seen this stuff before. So who's gonna actually run this hospital? NASA. You know, it's gonna have to be, it's gonna be, Civilian volunteers who are who belong to the CalMAT team or um, National Guard or DOD, and this thing won't be set up anytime soon in terms of trauma. This is a great resource for pandemic. You know, if we have one of those contagions, where people are dropping like flies, and it goes on for months and months, like an epidemic would. This would be good because you could show up and deal with the surge this way. For a, a fire, a bombing, an earthquake, this will only come in at the end. Okay, it'll probably get all the glory, but it'll actually show up too late for most of the casualties. So, 72, they used to say back in this era, now it's 96. This is um, a brand new hospital that was built in All of You. You ever heard of the UCLA All of You? If you look at the UCLA All of You, it's right next to the San Fernando. If you look at the hospital, it's there. Um, it's the same location, but it's not this hospital. This hospital is open a week. Then it had the San, the San Fernando earthquake. And this hospital, which they thought was okay, moved. It only moved about a foot. But you can see what happened is it broke every single thing on the main floor, all the electrical, all the wiring, all that. Our hospital was built initially to the same code as this one was. Now you know why those cross beams are on the outside. That's supposed to stop the building from going anywhere. Doesn't mean these buildings won't generally fall down, even in a fairly large earthquake, but they may become uninhabitable. That's why our building's supposed to be replaced by 2030. Um, what you can't tell so well here is this is one of the stairwells. All the stairwells fell off. So all the stairwells on the outside of the building fell away. <laughs> and the elevators, of course, didn't work. So they just started moving patients into the facility. They had to start moving them back out. They had to tear this down. They built a whole new hospital there. The new hospital there was actually, go there is, is glass, dark glass. So disaster. You know, you gotta get rid of this idea that it's some evil star, that somehow it's, you know, the stars are aligned against you. How do we have such bad luck to have this happen to us? It's random or unpredictable. Nah, it's just the way mother nature and people are. This is eventually gonna happen, so. And so you gotta prepare and plan for it, because someday it will happen. And you gotta ask yourself, what am I gonna do when the lights don't go out and I can't get money out of the ATM and I can't fill in gas, gas at the gas station and my kids are on some other part of town and the cell phones don't work, and I don't know where anybody is, what are we going to do? So, and the risk is going up there. There's more and more people, or more and more dependent on technology, you know? Just tell your teenager that they might not have the uh, ability to text or IM or Facebook for a week. It'll be the worst thing that ever happened, right? And <clears throat> new infectious diseases, you know? Things like SARS and, and bird flu and whatnot, things are coming to the woodwork that uh, are at a rapid rate. So. You know, sooner or later it's going to happen. Of course, the threat of terrorism is over there. The thing is, you know, we always think we're ready. Are we ready? Well, ICUs aren't designed to run empty. They're, they're only working well and making money when they're full. And there aren't a lot of extra ICU nurses and physicians around. And if they are, they don't know our system. We have ERs that are filled to the brim. We keep making them bigger. They just fill up as soon as we do. And we've got patients on the floors who need to be placed, which backs up the IMU, which backs up the ICU. And the fact is, you know, we should have learned how to do this by now, but all the, the reports we've looked at, 9-11 um, Commission or Katrina, show that stuff keeps happening, and we really don't learn the lessons all that well. We kind of learn them, but we really don't. And another concept, another misconception is everybody has is, it's going to be like it always is, it's going to be really busy for a while, because they've had some event where there was a surge in patients for a day or half a day, and 
things got a little busy. But they didn't really lose infrastructure, and they didn't really see what actually happens in a true disaster. And that's when basically you begin to get overwhelmed to the point where the normal systems, your normal procedures and protocols no longer can be used. You could also have some weird stuff show up. I mean, ant blast injury, chemical, biologic, radiologic, nuclear things. Or you could have things like um, anthrax or some other bioterror weapons, unusual diseases. The hospital itself, unfortunately, is also a target. So it's, uh, if depending on what's going on, uh, it could be a second hit against the hospital itself. You know, they may have attacked a particular target, like terrorism may go bomb up a political convention and later go and bomb the victims at the hospital as well, you know. And that can definitely have an effect on providing health care. Um, one thing to point out to you, most of the folks here today are nurses. This is the SARS epidemic in Toronto, which um, we uh, noticed that uh, most of the patient people who um, uh, actually got it, it looks like part of my slide fell away there, but um, looking at this, the first number um, shows you, uh, you know, who got the actual SARS and who died of it. Um, you'll notice that uh, most of the patients who got SARS, the largest group, were healthcare workers, mostly nurses. The second column is those who, who died. Most of the people who died of SARS in the SARS epidemic were nurses, mostly ICU nurses. A little fact that they don't talk about too much, but that's actually who took the brunt of, the, of that particular epidemic. It used to be physicians. This was one SARS victim walk, who came into the hospital at uh, Grace, a little hospital in Toronto, came in through the emergency door, waited in the waiting room for a while, got triage over at registration, went to uh, a trauma room, but decided to leave because there was too much of delay. And this is all the person that got SARS after that one person came in the ED. So you can see this stuff can be pretty contagious, right? That's why I love to see people wearing universal precautions because someday somebody wearing something like this is going to roll into our trauma bay and then you're going to give me a phone call about two days later saying, hey, did you look after Bands I-92? Yeah, you got to come in and get a whole bunch of blood work done because you may have been exposed to, I don't know, herpes simplex 26 or something. God help you. you know? <laughs> so. So, I mean, this was this. Um, this is actually the ICU during the SARS epidemic in North York, another hospital in Toronto. That's the nurse manager, that's the chief of nursing. Um, and they were doing the first line care of one of the patients who was dying, who actually was another nurse. Um, so, uh, the other nurses are all gowned up. That picture on the right there, this was all that was left of, um, of Charity Hospital um, in February after the. Um, August, Earth, August hurricane. That's what they were reduced to. So, you get an idea how that's so it can definitely affect the hospital. One of the things we have to uh, deal with is with the disaster is to stop the chaos on the outside, the outside world coming into the facility. If that chaos at the scene or the chaos in the community gets into the hospital, particularly if it gets into the high, high tech areas like the, the OR or the ICU, we're sunk, okay? So you have that scene chaos, and what happens if there's no control is basically the scene will come to the hospital, and then the scene becomes chaotic. And one of the things about an initial disaster is there's a lot of chaos. The chaos, um, the way it works is for about every minute of chaos, there's about 10 minutes of recovery needed. So if you have a really big disaster and it takes five or 10 minutes to, to get over that, that may take up to an hour before that chaos actually gets under control. The other thing too is if the disaster is close to the hospital, the hospital may have no, no ability to defend itself. They may be overwhelmed. So in Oklahoma City, just down the street from the, from the building itself, was one of the hospitals with an ED in Oklahoma. And the ED doctor and nurses knew that there was something had happened because their doors actually got blown off the hinges into the ER. So they're working away, kaboom, the doors come flying by. They look out the door, they see a wall of smoke and dust. They don't know what's happened. And a few seconds later, a mass of humanity all start to walk towards them. Okay? At that point, they know their day is pretty much shot. Okay? That's going to be a bad, bad day. And that hospital was effectively not working very well until they were able to get that chaos back under control. So you don't want the chaos to come to the scene. What you need to have happen is a plan and a way of switching on that plan so that the scene chaos stays at the scene, you still have a functional hospital. And that requires things like security, locked doors, controlling entrance, whatnot. That's why a really good idea why you should always be going home with your ID and keeping your ID with you in your car because if you have to negotiate your back way past the checkpoint, 
to get back to the hospital someday because it's a disaster, it's much better to have some ID with you than not to have it. In some cities like Vancouver, uh, Seattle thing too, there's actually a special little mark on hospital workers' ID that indicates they're allowed to drive their car during a disaster and use certain roads. Don't have that little mark on your ID, you can't drive on those roads. So, how do we recognize these things are happening? Who initiates the disaster response? Who's our incident commander? Who's the triage officer? These things are all kind of um, dealt with in the disaster plan. The disaster plan is online. The problem is because of groups like Joint Commission and whatnot, they put more and more demands on us to actually um, have certain things in the disaster plan. The disaster plan has uh, ballooned from about 30 to 35 pages. Now it's over 130 pages, plus there's annexes. So to read the thing is actually quite onerous. It's quite a big, uh, difficult thing to do. However, um, it is important to know The disaster response, the code triage, of course, on the back of your tag is the co what code triage is. That's a mass casualty event. That's initiated by the ER doctor. The administrator on call may have a, part, a role in that, but it's the emergency doctor, the emergency doctor on call that does that. Code oranges, which are internal disasters, they can be initiated by anybody. And so you can call a code orange because you see sewage coming out of the ceiling, or there's no power, or there's no, something else not working. Anybody can initiate that. Um, the triage officer is usually one of the ED physicians. And how are we gonna communicate? Probably the biggest problem we would have is how are you going to communicate in a disaster? You can see very quickly things like cell phones and landline. It's going to go down very quickly. During the power failure, you know, our internal telephone system stopped working. The only system was working was the red phones. Within a few minutes of that happening, got a call calls coming down to the instant command center is, where is the telephone list for the red phones? Well, you're supposed to know where to find that because it's in your it's in your binder. It's there. That's how. You, if you don't know how to find that, you get the red phone, but you don't know anybody's number, so you're kind of useless without <laughs> knowing what to do. With that so, um, and the security is the other big issue for that. And of course, this is a difficult issue because the hospital, you know, they bid for security and they usually get the lowest bidder. Um, and then we have our own we have our own security guys, but of course, you know, some are. Some of them move quickly and some of them not as quickly. But can you imagine, can you imagine what's going to happen if you have, um, say it's an epidemic and you've got the vaccine and you've got a mob that shows up, some of whom are armed, and they want to come inside the hospital now because they want their vaccine and, you know, your poor Renikoff saying, no, no, you can't come in. Um, you know, can you actually deal with that? So security is a huge issue. Um, and for our perspective, it's important to know that You've got to be able to have a way for staff and casualties to get in the hospital, but you know, keeping some pertinent people at a distance until you're ready for them, like the media, families, and the mass of worried well. You know, they think they got some funny dust on them, so they want to get checked out, but they have nothing wrong with them otherwise. So those patients, people need to wait. And of course, the other problem you have is mass providers. People will come out of the woodwork, volunteers. You know, we had an incident when uh, the ED staff set up an uh, alternate site at the Qualcomm Stadium in the last wildfires. Uh, Dr. Bono from the ED was down there with uh, helping out folks and we had a lot of people from nursing homes and diabetics, home ventilator people, all kinds of people in, the, in Qualcomm. They're trying to look after them and of course they're quite busy um, and in this particular person showed up and said she was a nurse from one of the fire departments and she said, you know, I'm here to help. And Dr. Bono said, well, that's great. And they put her to work and after a while, somebody from that particular fire department came by and they said, you know, thank us for sending us your nurse. And they said, uh, we don't have a nurse. So out was she not only not a nurse for that department, she actually was not even a nurse. <clears throat> so, you know, if you have an issue where people will show up and they'll be willing to help, but if you don't have some way of credentialing them in advance, knowing who they are, they may be more of a threat than uh, nobody else. So you need that protection. Um, scene safety, sometimes um, people get the idea that they should respond. So remember that hospital that was nearby Oklahoma City? Well, somebody said, you know, there's a bunch of kids hurt, so they sent kids, you know, sent nurses from the, uh, from the PICU and the NICU to the site because they thought they could help all these injured kids, which is a really dumb idea because it was a very unstable building, and these nurses ran over. They're not really equipped for dealing with a hazardous scene, and one of them didn't make it because something landed on her head. She wasn't wearing a helmet, and so she became a victim and, was, and died as well. So one of the things to recognize is if you're not trained for the pre-hospital environment or the disaster scene, 
the concept of rushing to the scene to help out because there's a lot of patients there, that's not a particularly good idea. Okay. So surge, you have two concepts of surge. Surge capacity means the space to take additional casualties above the normal level of resources. So you got a 20 bed ICU, can you expand 30%? Can you go up and become a, uh, you know, a 30 bed ICU? Is that possible? Well, yeah, you can do that. And any hospital is supposed to be able to have a surge of 30%. Sure, you're gonna have to shut down elective surgery, have to take over the PACU, you're gonna have to call people in. But can you actually do it well? And that's capability. That's the ability to care for those extra casualties. So if you have a 30% increase in casualties and they take up that extra space, will you do a good job looking after those people or do things actually have to change? And that's one of the, dis one of the difficult issues in dealing with surges. So this 30% of emergency surge capacity we talk about, you could, they say you might be able to get 10% of staff beds from expedited discharge. So somebody is waiting for some kind of a facility or a room, you start moving those people out and now no excuse is good enough if somebody's making excuses. Uh, you, you, cancel some, you cancel some surgery and some elective admissions, that might give you another 10%. And then you might be able to find some other area that you could go into, um, either licensed beds or unlicensed beds. If, some, if the local authority has actually declared a disaster, all those federal and state rules that we have to live by actually go away. There's actually a state law saying that Hospitals, doctors, nurses, and dentists are protected from lawsuit from anything they did in good faith during a disaster, as long as it wasn't particularly crazy. Now, that, that law dates back to the 50s, so it doesn't mention therapists or technicians, but hopefully they would be covered as well. Um, but as a result, you can use unlicensed beds if somebody has to do it. Now, unlicensed bed, is the CDPH going to do something? No. CDPH actually published the surge guidelines, so they know this, and the Joint Commission knows this as well. So once the disaster has actually been declared, if you have to put somebody in the hallway, or you've got to put somebody in the auditorium and look after them there, that's okay, that's legitimate. Is that going to be enough? So most counties have already have a surge capacity of 10 to 15 percent, and we have got a big emphasis in the last few years on EMS and pre-hospital care. Um, there was a lot of money thrown around the last 10 years for bioterrorism preparedness that's starting to dry up now. And the California EMS agency has had this all hazards approach, which means we should be able to prepare ourselves for anything. So is that gonna be enough? Well, think about where we are. We are kind of special. We are in San Diego, and 18 miles that way is a border. And on the other side of that border is a whole lot of people. Now, you might just say, we'll close the border. You have to remember that a lot of people on that border are, on the other side of the border, are Americans or are legal residents, and they have a right to cross the border. And so, as a result, you can get a lot more people. So, in a bioterrorism scenario, they say we have to be able to surge one bed per 2,000 population. Well, how many people with beds would that be? That would mean we would need, in a full-scale bioterrorism, 1,500 surge beds, okay? And that means uh, you've also got to remember the border people who have the right to cross the border. That's another 500 beds because a lot of those people can cross. And if it's bioterrorism, like SARS or um, avian flu, what's the new one? I'm forgetting the new, the new one, but um, anyway, up to 60% of those patients could be ventilated, could be ventilated long term. So how many ICU beds are you gonna need? You need 1,200 ventilated beds. How many ICU nurses is that? Five times 1,200 is like 6,000? Something's gotta give, right? That's not going to be that feasible. So when you talk about surge, you know, you gotta increase that expertise. You've also, at some point, gotta go back to looking after all the other patients, and you gotta do that right away because you know, during disasters, people still have babies, they still have heart attacks, that's where this happens as well. One of the things about trauma, unlike bioterrorism, bioterrorism though, you can, you do have a chance because it happens slowly. You know, the, um, the last flu epidemic actually happened in the three phases. It actually took over, over a year for the whole thing to evolve. In fact, it still may be evolving. We're not, not sure what the flu is gonna do this year. But for trauma, Things happen really quickly. It's going to happen real fast. 
And the real problem is there's a rate at which things start to fall apart. And you've all seen this, you've seen the edges of it when you start getting that trauma bay completely full and you've got like six or seven patients all at once, that's happened now and again over the years. This is from a, this was a model from uh, uh, Asher Hirschberg who worked in both Texas and in uh, Israel. And he pointed out that around five critical patients per hour, things started to fall apart. The quality of the care began to deteriorate. And what happens, what's really important about this is, you know, when you get up to about 15 patients an hour, you're doing really crappy work, unless you can really uh, expand your ability. But what really makes a difference here is this curve can go back and forth. If you're well prepared and have additional help and additional space, you may be able to go left or right. But the one thing that'll make this go really out of whack is um, this is bailing surge capacity and surge capability. But if you have a problem of over triage, that is, you're getting not just patients who are severely injured, but also patients who are minor injured, not much wrong with them, worried well, it actually decreases your ability to look after those patients. So that surge capability, you know, you gotta be able to deal with that. You also have to be dealing with the fact that we could have pediatrics, elderly patients. We do have a ventilator cache. Um, we have some ventilators in the hospital that are spare. We also have a cache available to us. But for instance, if you start getting into a large number of ventilated patients, you may have to adopt ventilators that you're not used to seeing before, things like the impact ventilator or other types of ventilators that generally are gonna require some just-in-time training you're used to because they generally are simpler than what we're used to. And of course, you need a lot of specialists to deal with that. So just to let you know, uh, if you're interested in, in surge and surge guidelines, um, this is the CDPH, the guys that come and torment us. They actually publish the CERT guidelines, so they know this will actually can happen. So this is available online if you want to look at it. It's actually quite comprehensive, but it talks about how the standards would change. One of the things that would happen in disasters, we would switch to what's called a population-based standard of care, which means you may actually have to be less aggressive or withdraw care in patients who have a low probability of survival because there's just not enough resources to look after them. That's one of the hallmarks of, of a true disaster. And interestingly, that's extremely difficult to do. Even for, for uh, clinicians, doctors and nurses have a lot of experience. People in war zones, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and Africa, they've always found that one of the most difficult things to do is the patient who you're uh, aggressively treating, deciding that in fact you don't have the resources to deal with that patient anymore, and you're gonna have to go to more comfort care measures on that patient because there are patients who need that bed and those resources more than that. That's one of the tougher things to think about. Yeah, but there is a lot of description in this, uh, on this website, CDPH, um, if you look under search guidelines, uh, has that there. The last issue I'll talk about is liability. This is the government code I was talking about. And you can see it says nurse, Dentist. nurses, uh, yeah, dentists, pharmacists, nurses, hospitals, and doctors. It doesn't mention therapists or technicians because it was 1950 something. They haven't modified this yet. I don't know if the Governor Brown will modify this, but, uh, but there is protection there. So if you're under a population-based standard of care and, so they, and the you know, clinicians and team decide that this person is not gonna be able to make it, they're gonna take up too much resources and you have to withdraw care, um, there is actually a coverage for that. It still needs to be documented, even in disaster. All right, any other questions? Otherwise, I'll let you go to lunch. Don't keep me longer. Thank you.